Good morning. morning. It's good to be back with you in person again this morning. Uh, Grateful to God that I have come back with negative tests from the COVID testing. Let us praise God for this is the day he has made. We need to rejoice and be glad in it for the wonderful gifts he gives us and the blessings in our lives. Let us worship God this day. For those that may see it, we have two sets of flowers here on either side of me. We had a very beautiful wedding here last night. One of our own, Megan O'Malley, uh, part of the O'Malley Potts family, uh, had the wedding to Clay Martin. It was a beautiful wedding. They left these flowers for us to enjoy. They are very beautiful. Uh, after pretty much service today, but tomorrow, the 16th through the 22nd. I will be on vacation for the next week, and our own Dan Klein will be in the pulpit next Sunday for us. Thank you, Dan, for being willing to do this for us. Uh, I've also got an announcement from uh, Corbin that starting this Wednesday night, for those who are in the choir, This will be the first rehearsal for the whole choir. It's hard to believe to say it's almost about a year and a half since we've last had choir rehearsal. But uh, for those that are interested in coming, 7 o'clock this Wednesday night. And this fall, starting on September 14th at 6.30 p.m. for 10 Tuesdays, I will be doing a book called This We Believe, Eight Truths Presbyterian Affirm for 10 weeks. It was written by a pastor I actually knew, uh, Steve Plunkett. Uh, He married into the Curry family, who many of you may know in this area. It is a really good book to help us, remind us of our Christian faith and who we are as Presbyterians. If you are interested, please let me know. I have books on hand. If you'd like to know more about it, I'll be glad to share with you. Let us worship God. This is our call to worship. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all. Amen. The fear of the Lord is is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. God praise endures forever. Please stand. As we sing hymn 276, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
This is our call to confession. The God revealed to us in the same pages of scripture is a welcoming and inclusive God who directs us to love one another. We seek to remove all the barriers that keep us from that love. Come now to confess all that separates you and others from our God. Please join me in prayer followed by a moment of silent personal confession. God of wisdom, wisdom and insight, we confess, we confess, our we confess that we have sought to conform instead of in your ways. We seek worldly comforts and possessions to satisfy a hunger within us that only you can fulfill. We humble our worldly measures to satisfy our quality when you see the awesomeness of your work in creation. We confess our foolish ways and confess our inner longing to follow you. Help us to turn away from the temptation to temporary gain, ease, and to live in the temptation of love, justice, and peace. In the name of Jesus, you are laid down for life, giving up the ways of the world so that we might know eternal love and life. Amen. A moment of silent prayer. Amen. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. <laughs> offering gifts at the front of the church or send them into the office. We will observe a period of reflection with music on what gives us and how we can give back.
Jim. Please remain standing for our prayer of commitment. Accept our offerings of praise and grateful thanksgiving for your presence in our lives and the many blessings you bestow upon us. May we be reminded that our life begins when we give with generous hearts to proclaim the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask these things, Lord God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The transition of the reign of David to that of Solomon is noted in 1 Kings 2nd chapter, verses 10 through 12. And Solomon's beginning is marked by a narrative of how he is divinely equipped but for the task in a dream encountered with God. Chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. 1 Kings 2, 10 through 12. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingdom was firmly established. 1 Kings 3, 3 through 14. Solomon loved the Lord Walking in the statues of his father David, he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. By night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and given him a son to sit on the throne today. And now, O oh my Lord, O oh, oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I'm only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people and discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word, and indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we sing hymn 341, Blessed Assurance.
may be seated. Join with me now in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You, O Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Turning now to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 51 through 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my flood, blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats with me li will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Okay, I've decided that with the Gospel of John chapter 6, it's actually a good time to hold trivia questions. And so I got another one here for you this week. In the Gospel of John, which chapter do we get the Last Supper? Especially if it's based very similar to what you would see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I know the first thought that many of you may have had, it's like, oh yeah, it's got to be there in the upper room discourses, the chapters 13 through 17. And yeah, it's probably right there in chapter 13. I know that's where the, Jesus washed the feet, so it's got to be in there. The answer is nowhere. In the Gospel of John, do we have the Last Supper, such as we see it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
Yes, go to chapter 13, and you could say, Ed, but look right here. It talks about a meal. Yes, it does, but it focuses more on who is going to portray Jesus and the dipping of the bread. We do not get the words of institution. We do not have the Last Supper as such. Now, you're probably looking at me and saying, Ed, why are you saying this? Why are you asking us this? Go throw an interesting thought out there to you that there are many biblical scholars who have read the Gospel of John that they suggest that if there is a Last Supper anywhere in the Gospel of John, guess where they find it? John chapter 6. A few weeks ago, when we read the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus blessed the food gave it to them, and then, of course, we had the miracle of what small amount there was. There was a huge return afterwards. And that especially as we uh, have with these last three Sundays seen, well, last two plus today, Jesus speaks quite often about being the bread of life. And that has a question that's been raising in my mind? Well, actually two questions. The first one is if John's version of the Last Supper is here in chapter six, how does that change the way we should look at the Last Supper or the, the communion when we participate and contemplate on it? And the second, it has to do with the verb that is used in this passage today in Greek for to eat. And it is a sense of a continual chewing, not just eat it, you're one and done. You constantly chew on it. What are the implications of that as we read this chapter? As we look to move forward from here, I feel that I have to state something again that I brought out last week briefly in my sermon. And that is we who are 21st century Christians already know the end of the gospel story. And that can be a problem sometimes for us because here we are in chapter 6, and we jump ahead. Oh, yes, we see it through his crucifixion and his resurrection. It's easy to do, and, and I'm not going to say anything against that, because it's because we know the end of the story, we are here. We believe. We are for, informed as we go about our faith life. And they are explained most of the time better through Jesus' death and crucif or his crucifixion and resurrection. But where it can get us into possible trouble is when we do not place ourselves as one of those in a particular passage in the gospel readings. And this many times has it that Christians have forgotten or have never learned things historically tied into these passages or even historically even before what's being read there of happenings or beliefs or otherwise that really tie into the gospel stories themselves and really do enhance much of what we're hearing and seen. John 6 has a lot of historical allusions to other religions in just this little brief snippet that I have today. And so there are a couple of other religions I need to touch upon very briefly to get us to understand the implications of what Jesus is actually saying in our passage about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. 
The first thing is, again, what he talks about the Jews in this passage, that they were disputing what Jesus was saying. It had less to do with that, what many scholars have called it, the grossness of what Jesus is saying about speaking of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's not what they were having an issue with. It was more about what Jesus was referring to as he says this that came out of these other religions. And keeping in mind that the Jews in John were those who were in authority positions. They were the leaders. They were the ones who were interpreting and also enforcing and also creating more of what the scriptures spoke to them. And to be able to do so, they had to be well informed of everything going around them, not only of the Jewish faith, but also of others along the line. And here we go. William Barclay gave a great detailed conversation on both of those that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to briefly try to cover what I can, but if you really want to understand what he has to say more, go to his commentary on the Gospel of John on this passage. He really does a great job. Both of these religions really go back before Israel itself was formed as a nation. And Israel took on especially the one. And this first one, it has to do with sacrifices. They were common because they were being done for the God of that religion. Now, a whole animal was used, but the whole animal was rarely ever burnt as a sacrifice, only part of it. The rest of it was cooked, and it was used to feed the priests and the worshiper who brought it. And the belief was that in eating part of this sacrifice, the person was also eating of that God, of that religion. And that person would then be God-filled because that sacrifice should be so pleasing to that God that that God should enter into that sacrifice and be part of that person. And in that, the worshiper would feel closest to that God. The other religion or religions, as they call it, are called the mystery religions. And one of the things that they did Another piece of trivia here for you. They offered communion with one's God. Again, as with the other religions, the other goal, or the goal was to become one with that God. And Barclay, I'm going to go ahead and quote him on this because he gave a few of the prayers that were used in three of the different aspects of the religion. Listen to them carefully. In the mysteries of Mithra, the initiate prayed, Abide with my soul, leave me not, that I may be initiated and that the Holy Spirit may dwell within me. In the Hermetic mysteries, the initiate said, I know thee, Hermes, and thou knowest me. I am thou, and thou art I. And in the same mysteries, a prayer runs, Come to me, Lord Hermes, as babes to mother's wombs. And in the mysteries of Isis, the worshiper said, As truly as Isis lives, so shall his followers live. As truly as Isis, Osiris is not dead, his followers shall die no more. Did you notice anything interesting about some of those readings? Go through the Gospel of John, and the words are very similarly used that Jesus speaks them, that the author writes that Jesus used them 
to show that he truly was and is God. So, getting back to those Jews disputing Jesus, it was all about his claim of being of God and God, as John goes back to the beginning of his gospel. So in their eyes, Jesus was being sacrilegious in what he was saying. They could not believe that he was the one they were waiting for and longing for. He was an ordinary human, born of Mary, son of Joseph and Mary, a carpenter. That's all they could see. They could not see him being the one they longed for, who they believed was the one of God who was going to come with a sword drawn, the angels and army coming with him and wiping out those they believed were oppressors of them. They could not see God, especially through Jesus, as one who's going to offer love to the enemy. And that leads to how John's version of the last or the Lord's Supper can be slightly different, a different take on some things. Now, no, I would never suggest that I'm going to change up the liturgy that we use on a regular basis to do away with what we've had in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and even 1 Corinthians that Paul writes. Because yes, there is much truth in that we do remember our Lord's saving death, his resurrection, and the promise that he returns again. But what if there is something missing, something vital, that John is trying to help recapture in the midst of his version. Caroline Lewis, in her commentary, brings out a good reminder that in John 6, the passage again speaks to Jesus being the bread of life. It is in the present tense. And John reminds us that Jesus is the living bread, not the dying bread. And what that can lead to as we participate in communion, yes, remembering Christ's death and resurrection, but it is also a remembrance that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that word, the living bread, is still with us through all of life. And when we eat and drink, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, it's not, it's not just the Lord's Supper on those Sundays and those special times of year that we observe it. It's every time we eat. We should be consistently chewing on the fact that God offers us life now along with a future time. David Lowe brings out something to consider that in this passage, Jesus, yes, gets all too gritty, even base in his imagery in order to confront us with the claim and the promise of the carnal God the one who became incarnate, who took on our flesh, becomes just like us so that one day we may be like God. And isn't that what we all want? Don't we all want to have this closeness with God? Don't we want it now? not just in the future. And that is where the hope comes from our passage today. David Lose is also saying that for G in Jesus, the word made flesh and in the sacraments, the word given physical, visible form, once again, we meet God who will be satisfied with nothing less 
than our whole selves. For flesh and blood is a Hebrew idiom which refers to the whole person, hearts, minds, spirits, feelings, hopes, dreams, fears, concerns, everything. In Jesus, you see, the whole of God meets us in love, redeems us, and sustains the whole of who we are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So as we hear these words from Jesus again, are we going to bring our whole being to God through Jesus Christ? Are we willing to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ daily so that our whole beings will be so close with God that we will feel as one with him? Do we even want to feel and live the God-filled life? That is exactly what Jesus is calling for in these verses we read today. For this whole passage in chapter 6, it is now up to each one of us. Do we want to be fed? As for me, I will seek to eat the bread of life daily. Join me. Be fed. Feel God. Now and forevermore. Amen. Please rise and let us affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Amen. He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Join with me now in prayer. Surprising God, in your deep love for us, you have broken into our lives in ways we could never imagine. You have come through the law and the prophets. You sent your son Jesus to save us. Through the ages you have sent those to proclaim your deep love for us, still breaking into our lives. And today we stand before you feeling broken inside as we continue to see anger and division in our world, in our nation, in our communities, and in our homes. We are left wondering if our nation and our world could truly ever be united again. We are in those moments we need to feel your breaking into our lives, that we love you and one another as you command. Today, help us recommit ourselves to our discipleship to you through Christ. And may our goal be that, as in the prayer that you have given us through St. Francis of Assisi, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. You are with us, O God. May that always be before us that we will never forget it. May we seek to feel your presence in all of our lives. May we always remember that we are your disciples through Jesus Christ. And may all our lives be so committed to you that we live each day as that disciple. And all this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rise and sing our closing hymn this morning. I sing a song of the saints of God.
Jesus is the bread of life. So whatever spiritual hunger we each have, bring before him, and he will give us life eternal. Go out in that peace and love. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us today and forevermore. Amen.